Hey friends, Jacob Moon here. Welcome to Every Nation GTA. It's wonderful to have you with us this morning. We're gonna begin this morning's service with the call to worship. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Let's pray together. Faithful God, we come into your presence, grateful for your unfailing love and your faithfulness. We come with gratitude and praise, offering you the worship of our hearts and lives. Open our eyes to see and know you. Open our ears to recognize your voice. Be present among us as we worship you and as we open ourselves to your word. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We are here together to lift our hearts as one. We're in our Father's presence. Spirit is with us. It is good to lift the name of the Lord our God. It is right to give Him thanks and praise. For His heart is overflowing with love for us. And this mercy we can never contain. faithful mercies and all that he has done for who can match his kindness and who can count his works well, let our praise continue till evening comes in close it is good to lift the name of the Lord our God it is right to give him thanks and praise for his heart is overflowing with love for us and this mercy we can never contain glory honor wisdom power and strength to our savior jesus worthy of all our It is right to give him thanks and praise For his heart is overflowing with love for us And his mercies we can never contain It is good to lift the name of the Lord our God It is right to give him thanks and praise For his heart is overflowing with love for us And his mercy we can never contain and this mercy we can never contain. And this mercy we can never contain. In that same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth 
that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will that all things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, or who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. As we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong Thank you, Jacob, for leading us in worship again today. Uh, what a great song. We are so happy that we actually get to serve the everlasting God, no matter what's going on. And truly right now, with the war in the Gaza Strip, lots of things are just really chaotic right now. And we still have the war in the Ukraine. What do we do in times like this? As believers, we're called to pray for peace. And today's uh, early church prayer is from Clement of Rome. And it's the one that just happens to be the next one in the queue for us. But I think it's fitting for today that this is our early church prayer. We beseech you, O Lord, to grant us your help and protection. Deliver the afflicted, pity the lowly, raise the fallen, reveal yourself to the needy, heal the sick, and bring home your wandering people. Feed the hungry, ransom the captive, Support the weak, comfort the faint-hearted, let all the nations of the earth know that you alone are God, that Jesus Christ is your child, and that we are your people and the sheep of your pasture. Amen. If you're just tuning in to our online church service here at Every Nation Church GTA, my name is Bert, the senior pastor of our church, and we give you a warm welcome today, especially if this is your first time ever joining us. And now we have some other people in our church that would like to greet you. 
Welcome to Every Nation Church. Wherever you're watching from, we're so glad you're with us today. We hope our time together will encourage and strengthen you for the week ahead. Our church is part of the Every Nation family of churches and ministries in over 80 nations around the globe. We believe God has a heart for every campus and every nation, including right here in the greater Toronto area. Since every person is loved by God and called for a purpose, we exist as a church to help people discover that purpose and to follow the call. Wherever you may be on your journey of faith, we'd love to help you take your next step. Let's do this together. Today we have a guest speaker. Aoife Keegan is a campus minister and actually a campus director with Every Nation in Ireland. Uh, she spoke this message at our recent Every Nation Go World Conference in Cape Town, South Africa. Um, you'll notice at the beginning when you hear her that she was actually supposed to be live and in person, but fell sick and needed to uh, send in the video, uh, um, her sermon by video rather. Anyway, it was a wonderful message and we're so uh, excited to be able to let you hear from another one of our Every Nation world leaders, uh, this time from all the way in Europe. I know that you're gonna enjoy this message so much. so sweet. Thank you so much. And I'm so sorry that I can't be with you in person tonight. I had a medical incident that has swept me off my feet and is keeping me off planes for a while. But please know that I am fully with you in spirit tonight. We are going to jump into the text Genesis 22. But before we do that, I want to teach you three essential Irish phrases. Are you up for that? Up for a bit of language learning? Here we go. Okay, phrase number one, dear Gwich, dear Gwich. Let's hear you say it. Okay, that was pretty good for our first go. Well done. Have a look at the person sitting beside you. Look them in the eye and say, dear Gwich. So much better. That is amazing. You guys are quick learners. Dia Gwich is how we say hello in Irish, but the phrase literally means God be with you. Isn't that a lovely way to greet people with a blessing that says God be with you? And God is with us right here in this room throughout this whole conference, and he's still going to be with you when you go home. He's still going to be there waiting for you. It's amazing. He's with us all the time. Okay, you ready for phrase number two? This is just one word this time. On shock. On sha. Okay, stick your hand in the air and say it together. On sha. You guys are amazing. You pick this up so quickly. On sha means here or I'm present. If you're in a classroom and the teacher is taking a roll call and you hear your name being called, you put up your hand and you say, On sha. Here I am. Okay, phrase number three. This is a little bit trickier. But you guys have done so well so far, I know you're going to nail it. On gag loss. On gag loss. Let's hear you say it. See, I knew you guys could do it. You're amazing. On gag loss literally means the wild goose, which is the early Celtic Christian's nickname for the Holy Spirit. And it just captures something of his personality, the wildness, the unpredictability. It reminds me of John chapter three, where it says the wind blows where it wills and nobody knows where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with all who are born of the spirit of God. And we can know that God is with us. We get to respond to him by saying, I'm sure here I am. And when we do that, when we sign up for life with Jesus, you never know where the wild goose of heaven is going to end up taking you, but it's going to be a good journey. 
Okay, Genesis 22, let's pause and pray before we dive into the word. Lord, thank you so much for the gift of ungod loss, the wild goose of heaven, your Holy Spirit who fills us, who clothes us with power from on high, who leads us into all truth. And Father, I pray that as we read your word, it would not just be information for us, but you would grant revelation from heaven that would result in the transformation, not only of our lives, but of every nation and every generation to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Genesis 22, starting from verse 1. I'm going to read through the whole text in one go, and then we're going to zoom in verse by verse. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and his son, Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them, together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. What a thing to ask of Abraham. That is a gag glass moment right there, a wild goose of heaven request. And I wonder, what had Abraham seen of God that his response to that request was instant obedience? And this passage begins after these things. Up until this point, Abraham had lived a rich life of walking with God. When he was 75 years old, God asked him to uproot his household, his whole business, and to go to a land that he'd never been to before that God was going to give him. 75 years old. Can you imagine that? 
And the adventure didn't stop there. Abraham encountered famine. He went to war a couple of times. He went on a rescue mission to rescue his nephew Lot and his family. He interceded with God to save and not destroy an entire city. Um, Abraham has a lot of courage. Abraham had lived life with God. And so then this request comes. God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. God only had to call Abraham's name once. And his response was instant obedience. And he said, here I am. Ansha. And the Hebrew word here is hine, which we translate as here I am. But it's so much more than that. It's you're looking in a crowd for someone that you know, a bit like you were doing at this conference. You're looking to pick out those people you've met before and those new friends that you've made. And you hear someone calling your voice and you look up and you lock eyes with that person and you say, Hine, look, behold, here I am. Abraham was someone who knew what it was to lock eyes with God. And that was his response to hearing his name once. Here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. This is such a counterintuitive command. Abraham knows God. Abraham knows that God is against human sacrifice. He knows that we're, he's against murder. But yet again, his response is, I trust the Lord. I know the Lord. I've seen the Lord. And God is not just asking a father to sacrifice his son here. Abraham through his life, had amassed great wealth. He'd become a great businessman. His flocks were massive. His um, livestock was just increasing day by day. And he laments, he's almost complaining to God a bit. And he says, Lord, you've blessed me and prospered me so much. And yet when I'm gone, it's all going to go to my household servant. The deepest desire of Abraham's heart was a son. He had all he needed, but there was just one thing he wanted, a son whom he could take all of this blessing that he had amassed and pass it on to the next generation. But this wasn't just a God asking a father to sacrifice his son. This wasn't just God asking Abraham to sacrifice the deepest desire of his heart. Isaac was a child that God had promised and that God had provided. It just seems counterintuitive. Abraham wanted a child, but through that child, God wanted to birth a nation that would be a blessing to all the nations of the world through every generation. So this request seems like God was cutting off his own will and desire halfway through. It didn't make sense. Verse three, so Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. God calls Abraham's name once, asks this crazy intense request of him. And Abraham's response is immediately to get up early in the morning and make provision for a six day hike, three days out and three days back. He starts strong, instant obedience. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. This theme of seeing and looking is something we see all through this passage. It's incredible. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. Now that phrase, the boy, it also gets translated as a young man. Isaac at this point was not a toddler. He could have been anywhere between the age of 10 years old and mid thirties. Isaac was old enough to have an opinion. Isaac was old enough to resist what was going to happen. He was old enough to put up a fight and run away. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. He took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them together. 
And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. Now, I don't have children of my own, but I can imagine that Abraham, knowing what he was about to do and going, what kind of father am I? Those words, my son from his beloved son, Isaac, would have cut deeper into his heart than the knife would have cut into Isaac's flesh as he carried out what God had asked him to do. And his response was, here I am, my son. On Hine, look at me. And Isaac's not stupid. Look what he says here. Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Isaac knows that two and two does not equal five. He sees that the wood is there, the fire is here, but he's like, where is the lamb? And Abraham responds with a truth that is so much more powerful than the reality that he is about to face into. Look at what he tells Isaac here. Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. That's the second time this phrase has come up. They went, both of them, together. Abraham and Isaac are in agreement. Isaac implicitly trusts his father. And you know the thing about a burnt offering? It's completely irreversible. God was not just asking Abraham to kill his son. And we know that from the book of Hebrews, it hints and says Abraham knew that God could raise Isaac from the dead. But burn the offering, it's completely irreversible. That it, you're, you're just left with ash. That is it. But they went both of them together. And when they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there. Now, if you've read through Abraham's life at all, you'll know that Abraham was in the habit of building altars. When he came to a new place or God had done something new, Abraham was in the habit of stopping to build something, a physical, tangible reminder of the goodness and faithfulness of God and to offer him worship and praise him for who he is and what he has done. But Abraham had never built an altar like this on which he was about to sacrifice not only his child, not only the deepest desire of his heart, but the promise that God had made and that God had fulfilled. He built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. Abraham heard the voice of God, called his name just once. The result is instant obedience. He instantly starts off on that three-day hike. But Abraham doesn't just start strong. I don't know if you've ever been on a three-day walk before. Uh, if you have company, you do talk away to each other. You do things to pass the time, but you have a lot of time to think. And I know if I were in Abraham's shoes, I would be seriously second-guessing. Did God really say it seems very out of character with the God that I know. And um, if I were in Abraham's shoes, I would be thinking of a way that to choose the option that leans in the direction of obedience, but which hurts a lot less. I would be think, rationalizing disobedience and going, nah, God didn't say, I'm going to choose comfort over kingdom. And yet he didn't. Abraham took the knife and was ready to slaughter his son. He was ready to see it through to the very end. Friends, we don't just want to start strong. We want to persevere and we want to keep going right through to the end. But the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. When it came to obedience, the Lord knew he only had to call Abraham's name once. But he saw that Abraham was so committed to follow through with what had been asked of him that he called his name twice just to make sure <laughs> that he intervened at the right moment. And again, what was Abraham's response? On Shah, look, here I am. Oof. <laughs> Verse 12, he said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, 
seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. The test was that God was asking, now that the promise has been fulfilled and you've received the deepest desire of your heart, am I still first? Am I more to you than your own flesh and blood? Am I more to you than the deepest desire of your heart? Am I more to you than the promise that I made and the promise that I fulfilled? And Abraham, through his instant obedience, his response was an overwhelming, yes, Lord. Verse 13, and Abraham lifted up his eyes and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up, up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. And there's another way to translate that phrase into English. The Lord will provide can also be said, the Lord will see to it. And when we see God clearly, just like Abraham, his consistent faithfulness to him throughout his whole life, resulting in a response of instant obedience, we know that no matter what God calls us to, he will provide. He will provide the impossible. He will provide the crazy things that we need. There is nothing too much for him. And just as Abraham was willing to see it through right to the end, God is more than willing to see to it that every need will be provided for. Thank you, Jesus. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself, I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. You know, God does not ask anything of us that he is not fully willing to do himself. And even as Abraham was willing to see it through right to the end, God stopped him and intervened. But God allowed his own son, Jesus, his only begotten son, beloved by him, to see it through right to the end, to go to the cross for his blood to be shed, his life to be spent for us to completely wash away our sins. And Jesus was not an unwilling participant. He and the Lord, Father God, they went, both of them, together. And I think of Jesus kneeling in the Garden of Gethsemane before his arrest, before his death, wrestling with his father and saying, Lord, if there's any other way that this can go down, I'll take it. But nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours be done. Jesus completely surrendered himself to the will and the love of the Father. Oh, powerful. And Abraham was willing to do that. And the Lord says, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. I love this. God is a multiplying God. Abraham had just this one beloved son, the son that he loved. And you as a student, you may be the only Christian in your class. You may be the first Jesus follower in your family. I know I am. But God's promise is that as we respond to him with wholehearted, instant obedience, we will not remain alone. But he will multiply us. He will multiply disciples and children for himself so that we can't even count them. How amazing is that? And not only that, but in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. And you know what? You and I are still reaping the blessings that God unleashed to the nations and to the generations because of one man's obedience. That's so powerful. What had Abraham seen of God? that his response to this test was instant obedience. Now, you know, we've already talked about how Abraham had seen God's faithfulness to him consistently throughout his life. I wonder if there's more to that. You know, in Romans, it says that Abraham was unwavering in his belief. But as we look through his life in Genesis, we see that there are moments 
There were twice where he, Abraham was afraid of the king nearby and he thought that they would look at his wife, Sarah, and want to take her. So he lied to save his own life and said, she's my sister, you can have her. And yet God still remained faithful to Abraham. And I don't know about you, but that gives me some comfort. He didn't just mess up once, he messed up twice. <laughs> and God was still faithful towards him. And when God had made the promise to Abraham and Sarah that he would give them a son, this son of promise from their own flesh, Abraham in the waiting, because it was years between the promise and the fulfillment, decided that he was going to help God. And Ishmael was born from Sarah's servant, Hagar. Now, I know that you guys are a lot more sanctified than I am, and you would never, ever try to help God. But I know that I have often tried to help God fulfill his promises. And let me tell you, it does not work. I have created some messes in my time. And this situation with Ishmael, that was a big old mess. And yet God didn't write Abraham off. He didn't go, oh, you've just messed up one too many times. We're done. God, in spite of Abraham's wavering and stupid decisions, decided to remain faithful to Abraham and to still deliver that child of promise. There is no mess that you have made or are still to make where God is still not unwilling to extend his faithfulness towards you. And when we can see that faithfulness and grab a hold of it and have our eyes open to it, we will respond with an overwhelming yes to the will and the love of God. And can you imagine if we are still reaping the blessings of Abraham, that one man's obedience thousands of years ago, if one of us in this room were to choose to respond with the same level of obedience, saying, Lord, there is nothing so dear to me that I'm not willing to get rid of it forever in order to faithfully say yes to you, Nations will be changed and generations will reverberate with those blessings. There is a blessing that is unleashed through radical obedience that has a power and a force and a grace and a beauty like nothing before from one person. Now, what would it look like if a whole generation of students and young people had that heart attitude and that willingness to see obedience through to the end? Friends, the world would not be the same. And in the 6th and 7th centuries in Ireland, a missional force was unleashed. A church planting movement was unleashed that planted churches all through the British Isles, through Europe and to the ends of the earth. And there is a story which I love. I'm not 100% sure if it's fact or legend, but it certainly captures the spirit of Christianity in that day and in that place. And there was one church planting team of 12 that got in a boat, launched onto the Irish Sea, threw all their oars overboard and cried out to Angar Glas, the wild goose of heaven, saying, Lord, the wind and the waves still respond to the name of Jesus. So we know that wherever this boat ends up is where you want us to plant a church. And they threw their lives at the mercy of God. And they planted a church where they got washed up on that shore. And there's an ancient hymn from that time in Ireland called Be There My Vision. And that phrase is translated from the Irish, Be Hossa Imahula. And it literally means be in my eyes. And the concept is that God is so close and so real and so big that he completely fills my field of vision. And when you see God like that, when he is all you can see, he's in your eyes, he fills your field of vision, everything else fades into obscurity and it's just him. And there's not an ease to obedience, but it certainly becomes a natural response to God being all you can see. And friends, I bless you with God expanding your capacity to see him like never before, that you would experience his nearness like never before, his presence and his closeness like never before, and his majesty and his grandeur and the sheer scale of him like never before. And I bless you 
with from there being able to say, Lord, I put you first before the deepest desire of my heart and before the promise that you made, you fulfilled. I put you first before every answered prayer. I'm willing to completely eradicate it forever if it means doing life with you. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. A wonderful message from Aoife and capping it off with a beautiful hymn, Be Thou My Vision. Being at the World Conference in Cape Town just the other week, we got to see uh, every nation people from 71 different nations. And it really did renew our vision and why we are in a global city like Toronto doing our part to reach out not only to Canadian born people, but to people who fled into our city from around the world. So it was really refreshing for all of us who were able to attend the conference. We're going to continue now to worship through our giving and connecting those points. One of the reasons that we give uh, to God and present our tithes and our offerings is because we feel that we've been called to Christ to help fulfill the vision that he has given to us. And so when we give, we're giving out of worship but we're also giving because God has called us into a global vision to see people touched with the love, with the word, and with the deeds of our Lord Jesus Christ. And now let's recite our offering prayer to together. God, our Father, everything we are and have belongs to you. Out of your generosity, you have given us so much. Today, we bring our tithe to you, the first tenth of what you have already given to us. We desire to give as an act of worship and to become more generous like you. We pray that you help us steward the possessions that you have entrusted to us and guard our hearts from the deceitfulness of riches that seek to choke your word from our hearts. We give in faith knowing that you will be true to your word by opening up the windows of heaven to meet all our needs. Bless this offering and use it to advance your kingdom. Amen. And I will give you just a few seconds for those of you who like to give 
during our worship service. Before we go, just a couple of announcements to let you know what's going on. First of all, uh, we will be back uh, in person next Sunday. Um, here's our opt October schedule. Right now, this fall, we're doing three in-person services per month. So um, since October happens to be a five-Sunday month, that means that this uh, month we're having two online services. But normally this fall, we've been doing three out of the four in person. When we get to December, we're actually going to be doing four because we'll also be having a Christmas uh, Eve service. So uh, please follow along uh, our schedule. It's not in a perfect rhythm. Uh, we've had to make the schedule like this because of our availability of personnel. Also, it's not too late to squeak in uh, to get in our foundations course. The material is self-directed online with a weekly Zoom call with your cohort. If uh, you want to move forward and take another step towards membership in our spiritual family, uh, then it's imperative that you take the Foundations course. And even if you've had other uh, foundational material in your life, this has been revamped and updated, and I think you'll really uh, benefit from it no matter who you are. And now for our benediction. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Have a great week, everyone.